I'm Ray Belsky from Rayplex, and today I'd like to talk to you about the different tools that are used in fiberglass laminating. We start with two simple tools. One is a chip brush and one is a go brush. These are generic terms that we've given these. Uh, but the wooden brush called a chip brush is basically a disposable brush. It's safe to use for laminating. Uh, you'll have no cr chemical cross-contamination. And it's inexpensive enough that if you don't, if you're on a job site or you're doing a job on your boat and you don't have access to acetone, you can just, when you're done with it, just throw it away and not have to worry about the cost. Um, chip brushes hold a little bit of resin. The bristles are fairly uh, stiff. Uh, you can use them for laminating. They make a nice, simple job. The gold brushes are a little softer. The bristles are a little wider in comparison to the to the goat, to the chip brushes. They hold a lot more resin, so it means less strokes from the bucket to, the, um, to your job. Um, excellent tools. They come in a variety of sizes from four inch, three inch, two inch, one inch, and a half inch. So whatever your application is, Rayplex has the tools that you can use in the brushes to do your job with. I should also mention that the chip brushes are available in the same series of 4 inch, 3 inch, 2 inch, 1 inch, and half inch. Again, a disposable throwaway brush. Next, I'd like to talk to you about rollers. And rollers are a great product for getting a larger amount of resin than a brush from your bucket of resin onto your laminate. The most inexpensive roller going today is our little junior roller. It's about 1 inch in diameter. It has about a 4 or 5 millimeter nap on it. It's great. It's easy to hang on to. Uh, it even comes with an interchangeable nut on the end that you can put replacement rollers on. Uh, if you happen to forget about them, they come with a pack of two with a spare a set of end caps. Save the nut and you can use that. Get many application times out of this great roller. Moving up the ladder, we have the four inch rollers. This one here happens to have, have a custom uh, sleeve on it, our 6009 roller. This is about a 10 or 12 millimeter nap. It's a lamb. It will just hold a large volume of resin. So if you've got to get a lot of resin on a laminate, this is a, br a roller for you. Um, also moving along from the 4 inch, we can take you up into a 7.5 inch roller frame. Today everything is slide on, slide off. Just take the roller, slide it on. There it is. You're ready to use. When you're done, no need to clean it up, throw it away. These things are a couple of dollars. Very excellent value for their money. Along with, we have the beautiful 6009 roller. Slides on, slides off. This one, you can get almost a half a quart of resin in that little roller right there. This combination here is also available in 9 inch for those that really have a big, big job to use. Um, the roller sleeves come individually packaged. They're available either by the box or by the case or individually. Um, you'll find them excellent value and Rayplex carries a large variety uh, that you'll find that'll work well for your laminating needs. Again, all these products are proven and tested. They work with fiberglass resins. They work with epoxy resins and they're acetone safe. You won't find them dissolving uh, and there'll be no impurities coming out of the, ro the roller going into your laminate. After you've got your laminate uh, saturated with resin with a number of layers of matte, roving cloth, or Kevlar carbon fiber that you've chosen, it's time to really work the air out. And air is an important feature that you need to get out. Um, it degrades the laminate. It will actually draw water moisture into it because it creates an air bubble. And mechanically, it deprives you of the strength that you need. So for top quality laminates that are strong, and very professional. You want to use one of these tools. Anyways, starting at the bottom, this is our junior roller. A little junior spiral roller. It has spiral grooves in it. It's great for getting the air out. If you're on a job site and you don't want to uh, bring along an expensive roller that possibly you, you might get forgot about, that uh, wouldn't get cleaned, these are what you can use. They're almost disposable, but they can be cleaned. Moving along in technology, one of the nicest things that took place in the industry a few years ago was exchange rollers. And exchange rollers just slide on, slide off, and they're ready to use again. 
Uh, this is an aluminum fin roller. It has an appropriate number of fins in there. They're available in half inch, three quarter inch, one inch diameter, and three, four, and six inch, and eight inches in length out to here. The eight inch one does get to be a bit of a handful to hang on to. Um, next, again, here's a smaller version of the, uh, this is a five eighths by three aluminum roller. Great for getting in small grooves. One of the nicest things that's come along is the bristle rollers. And the bristle rollers really are nice because if you've got an irregular surface, say something with a lot of bumps or an irregular groove that just, one of these rollers just isn't fine enough to get in or you're going to be chasing air bubbles around, this roller is great. One is these little bristles will puncture through the laminate and if there's an air bubble it will allow it to rise up. They're great. It's hard to really explain but you'll see one in action later on and you can be your own judge. Well, as we move along with the tools of the trade in fiberglass here, one of the things that you really have to think about is the bucket you're going to put your resin in. Now, you probably think, well, I got an oil can around here or a margarine tub you can use. Let me tell you, in, my, in almost 40 years of experience, nothing's worse than to see somebody come in and they've got a bubble, some contamination that's gotten into the laminate. I can't stress it enough that cleanliness is godliness in laying up fiberglass. Contamination can ruin a, uh, a product or pro put a void into it and it means a costly repair for you which is time consuming, especially if it's in gel coat because now you've got to try and blend a color in again, get the shine and the sheen back. So always when you're doing your laminate, use brand new buckets that are designed for fiberglass. All of the buckets Rayplex sells are, we've proven in our own shop and have used them over and over again for uh, fiberglass laminating. They are safe, they'll work well, you'll have no contrast contamination with your resin, gel coat, epoxy, or any other type of resin you want to use with them. Now, watch out for imitations. Some of these people may want to sell you a, a, a tub that maybe has a plastic or a wax lining in it. Wax will actually work its way into the laminate and you may get some separation between the layers just through a little bit of contamination. Anyways, some of the other reasons you might want to think about. Here's an actual tub that I've cut in half. But what I want to point out, and this is where the troublemakers usually lie, is down in this little corner here, you will get, if you've had something in that tub before, as a margarine tub or an oil can, uh, it can collect in there and when you go to scoop it with a brush you always get the last little bit out and that's usually at the end and that's just when the problem happens, right at the end of the laminate. So use professional containers. These tubs are available a multitude of size. You'll find the right one that the right, that's the right size for your job. Little ones for gel, small gel laminates, uh, small repairs. Uh, bigger repairs and then the repairs get bigger still and finally big gulpers. We also have them available in 12 liter or two and a half gallon or five gallon pails in plastic that you can use for mixing your resin in. Again they're all brand new containers, they're, they're crystal clean and you'll have no contamination in your resin or gel coat or epoxy. An important subject we need to brush on before we get into our video here on fiberglass is catalyst levels in resin. When you purchase a can of resin from Rayplex, we give you a small bottle of catalyst that is approximately one and a half percent by volume to the contents of the can. We'll later get into the chart behind me and we'll discuss this in later detail. Also another important feature is on the back of each can is a cure chart that matches the approximate cure or working time you should get using this resin or gel coat. This chart and concept is also expanded into our larger containers. We have a two ounce container for 128 ounce or 3.78 liter size container of resin or gel coat. The working time you'll have to work with in using your fiberglass resin or gel coat will depend on two factors. One is the temperature that the material and the outside air temperature is and the amount of catalyst that you may have added to your resin. Now 
very simply what this means is the warmer it is you'll see your working time decreases or the more catalyst you add again your working time decreases this is the amount of time that you should get the resin to stay liquid before it starts to gel so uh, if you have one and a half percent which is approximately what we give you in a catalyst bottle with the resin so if you mix a half a can you can use a half a bottle mix a quarter can use a quarter bottle you'll roughly be at this catalyst level if you reduce the amount of catalyst level you will increase the amount of working time that you'll get for your resin to stay liquid the same thing happens with the temperature if you work in the morning you'll have a you'll get more working time out of your resin as opposed to working in the afternoon when the temperature increases uh, your working time decreases one important feature I should mention too is or drawback to resin is if you have to work outside and you're working in direct sunlight this chart pretty well doesn't apply because sunlight is like a combination catalyst and promoter and it will literally probably reduce your working times by about a quarter so if you had 30 minutes here you might get five or six minutes outside in direct sunlight anyways now let's move on to our video on the on laminating fiberglass good afternoon folks we're going to mix up some resin right now so you can see the processes that we go through we're using the Rayplex unwaxed resin and Bernie is pouring off an amount of it you can see some good shop practices here to prevent drips next he's going to add some catalyst into the product now we won't be measuring this this is more by our professional experience but you see he uses the lid and we're pouring into a 35 ounce container there and what happens is is when you mix resin the color changes you always turn the bucket a little bit and stir from the bottom always mix for about 20 or 30 seconds to make sure you've got a thorough mix okay now in this operation we're going to lay up two layers of ounce and a half mat using a chip brush so you can get the idea of the difficulty that's involved here you can pretend that this piece of cardboard is your mold we're pre wetting the product out the idea is to wet the product out thoroughly in a uniform fashion and you'll notice that the mat has changed from a, a white material to a almost clear this tells you that you've got enough resin on there for an average repair job such as fixing the inside of a fender this would be a process that you would use to get a good a good laminate little bits of air bubbles are tolerable and you'll get good adhesion now we're using the go brush and Bernie's going through the same process here again of wetting pre-wetting out a board taking the resin you'll notice with this brush it holds a lot more resin and it makes it really good for doing a real quick laminate there it is folks in a matter of of 20 or 30 seconds we've got a two layers of ounce and a half fiberglass laminated with a general purpose unwaxed resin you could use that material there for a car repair again the difference between the two brushes is the chip brushes are less expensive they take a little longer to use the go brushes work a lot faster in this application we're going to use the big fuzzy roller and we're going to be laying up a three layer pass of matte roving mat once the rollers become saturated they they tend to hold a lot of resin and you can continue just to apply layer after layer this would be great if you were in a tight spot working under a deck and didn't have the access of dipping into a bucket so this would give you that ability to go in and get your layup or your patchwork done and to carry the resin basically inside that roller there we have in a matter of a few seconds a laminate done with matte roving and matte using our big 6009 rollers.
Okay folks, now we're going to start de-airing the laminate with an aluminum roller. For your benefit, we're only going to de-air half of the laminate. Now you'll notice how you see that shiny surface? That's the excess resin being forced to the surface. That lets you know that you've got enough resin in the laminate that you're not going to have a dry laminate. Now you can see the actual difference there that's occurred by waiting about a minute and a half since we laminated that and now we're using just an aluminum roller to go over that so the left side has, has been rolled and the right side hasn't. Okay it's been about four minutes since we laminated that last piece here. I've come in real close with the camera here to try and show you the difference in laminate texture. This is the aired side or the de-aired side using an aluminum roller and then I'm going to move over here to this side and you can see the actual air that's trapped in this laminate. It's quite significant. This would actually lower your strength, allow water or other impurities to uh, work its way into the laminate over time. This is a good example of rolling and non-rolling a laminate using an aluminum roller. What we're doing here now is we're just using one of our plastic rollers on that laminate we just had. We're going to finish it off with just one of the inexpensive plastic laminate. You don't need a professional tool just as long as you've got a good ridged roller and we're going to clean the rest of that laminate up. Go ahead Bernie. A slow motion usually helps to move the air to allow it to work its way out through the laminate. All of these rollers we've dipped them in resin ahead of time so that they're, they can add a little bit. Surprisingly enough, the um, air as it comes out has to draw resin down into the pocket that was there originally. So you can just see the resin on the top surface of that laminate. And there's a comparison between an aired laminate using an aluminum roller on the left and a plastic roller on the right. Not much difference. Moving along with our demonstration, Bernie is going to show us now how to wax a fiberglass mold using a high quality high carnauba content wax. In our shop we've favored honey wax but there are many other brands on the market available. You may find one that works best for you. Bernie's now going to start by putting the wax on the mold. The mold has been blown off and cleaned off of any PVA. We've taken the dust off. One of the important things to remember is to use nice circular motions and go around. Wax is that wonderful agent that will prevent your gel coat or glass from sticking to the mold. You want a nice rich coat so that the wax saturates itself into the mold. This being a production mold we're only going to be required to put on one coat here. The mold sat for a, f a 30 seconds here just for the wax to soak its way in. Now he's going to wax the mold off. An important thing to remember here is just don't use any old rags. One of the little catches that may surprise you someday is you'll get a rag that you may have used with buffing compound. Well buffing compound never comes out of the rag and as a result it'll embed itself in and all it will do is scratch through the wax surface that you've just put on. Then when you put the wax on later you'll have the privilege of having a very difficult time getting your mold and your gel coat to separate. Usually they come apart in pieces this is a common problem, so always quarantine your waxing rags and either keep them in a plastic bag or someplace safe. Another thing to be concerned about too is that wax is a petroleum based product and should you just pile your waxing rags up in a heap, there is the possibility of spontaneous combustion. After you've waxed your mold thoroughly, PVA is always recommended as an insurance policy. Rayplex offers two applicators for putting PVA on. One is a commercial spray gun that Bernie has there. These are relatively low cost. We've actually found them to be better because it saves on the maintenance cost of rebuilding a gun. These things are so inexpensive that you can basically throw them away when they need servicing. That's the way the world seems to be going today. On the other hand is a preview sprayer. If you don't have access to a an air compressor. These are a great little tool for um, putting PVA on a mold. First Bernie's going to 
PVA the mold using a little preveal sprayer. These are quite handy for small parts, which this little part certainly fits into the category. With a bolt mold, you certainly wouldn't use something this small. But what we'd like to show you is that Bernie's going to do half the mold here and with PVA. You want to get a nice little wet coat on. You're going to see the mold a little wet. And then on the other hand, we're going to show you using a commercial spray gun. We're just going to dust the mold or spray the mold with that. And he'll do the other half of the mold. We tend to put a lot of air on, which drives the PVA out. Good. We now have a mold ready to gel coat. Now, this will take about 20 minutes for the PVA to dry. You may run into problems where if you get too much PVA on, it'll puddle, and sometimes you'll just have to mop that up and then let it, and just touch it up with a little spray. In the summer times, it can sometimes take about 20 minutes to even an hour for PVA to dry, depending on the humidity in the air. Watch for deep pockets, especially if you're not getting air circulation. Remember that what we're doing is evaporating water and alcohol. So, and that, uh, when it dries, forms a film on your mold. In this example, we've applied three wet coats of PVA to the mold. You can see the separation line as I draw my finger across the mold. 30 minutes later, the PVA film can be peeled off the part and stretched. Think of PVA as liquid cellophane. Before we start uh, gel coating, I'd like to bring to your attention some of the characteristics of paintbrushes here. I've cut away the heads of a paintbrush, and the construction of a paintbrush is basically a handle connected to a furl, which is the metal part, and along with the insert that holds the brush assembly on there. You'll notice the gap inside there. That gap, if your brush has been soaking in acetone, may or may not fill up with acetone. Nothing's worse is when you've previously used the brush for putting on black gel coat and it's been soaking in acetone that may have become discolored. Now you happen to use some white gel coat and you get these little black drips all over the mold. This can certainly add to the frustration and take away the glamour of what you're trying to do and create a fiberglass part. Also, Bernie has another brush over here. This is what I'd like to bring to your attention too, is sometimes old paint brushes are built all using the same construction and we have a tendency to get something out of the basement. But you'll notice just above, right there, there's, that spot can fill up with paint. And when you mix paint and resin or paint and gel coat, you're just, you're inviting contamination into your laminate and possibly a failed product in some area that may require fixing or repairing later on. The next stage of our laminate is the application of gel coat. What we're going to do here is now pour off about a pound of Rayplex black gel coat into one of our containers. The material is quite thick. This is a brushing gel coat. It's very copious, it's thick. It hasn't been thinned with any ingredients. If you were going to use this gel coat for spraying, you would probably add about 10% styrene to it to bring up its viscosity uh, so it's suitable for spring. Next, we're going to add catalyst into it. Here we're going to use one of our catalyst dispensers. These are very handy for this job. We're going to add about three to four cc's of catalyst into this mixture. Okay, now Using a brand new clean paintbrush, Bernie's going to show you the techniques for applying gel coat on this mold. You get lots of gel coat on there, and what you're trying to do is not paint it on, but basically brush a coating on. The coating will go on approximately about 10 times as thick as you normally see for paint. But gel coat is very thick. You're going to roughly one pound of gel coat will cover about anywhere from three to five square feet. You can see how thick that material is. It almost runs that. When it's at that stage, you know you've got just enough on there. And there we have it, a finished coat of gel coat on there. 
This black gel coat will now need about anywhere from half an hour to an hour and a half to cure. One of the tests that we use for cured gel coat is to just use your fingernail in an area that is, is a scrap area of the, the product and see if you can cut it. If you can cut through the gel coat with a fingernail, your gel coat isn't cured. Good recommendations are two to four hours and you'll always get a good solid cure without any of the problems of um, alligatoring or other problems that can occur to gel coat. Moving along with our next stage in the lamination process, we're going to now put the fiberglass matting saturated with resin onto this product. Again, we're using the Rayplex unwaxed resin. There, you can see it at the bottom of the right-hand side of the screen. And now Bernie has already, ahead of time, pre-measured out the resin required, and he's adding the catalyst. Would like to mention that safety glasses and gloves are always a, a good idea for this application, as accidents can happen. He's again mixing the resin very thoroughly. Give it again 20 or 30 seconds for, for mixing for the process of adding the catalyst to blend in with the uh, resin. This process, by the way, is called induction, where the molecules actually attach themselves to, the, uh, to the resin to start the chain linking process. Bernie's going to use a technique here, which is pre-saturating out the mat in advance. Now, this is a technique that a lot of fiberglass shops use where you'll use a wet out board. Apply some resin down, good thick coat. Then you put a layer of mat on top. Just soak it down. Just sets that off to the side now. And he goes for his bigger pieces. and you can apply one layer after another. Every laminator has his techniques for lamination. Some of you may actually wish to do the whole work, the whole lamination right on the actual mold as, as opposed to wetting your pieces out. But this is an excellent example of another technique that works very successfully in the lamination process. Now moving along, we're going to wet out the actual mold itself. Again, we're using one of our little three inch junior rollers. Now, one of the interesting things and techniques that's happening here is fiberglass mat has a binder in it. If that piece had just been wet out, you wouldn't be able to fold it over the top cone like that. You really have to let your mat wait a minute or two for the binder to break down. And the binder's broken down with some of the chemical ingredients that's in the uh, polyester resin. This is why. That first bit of piece of mat is just a cap that we put on the top there. That part, is, the top is actually cut off. Now he's adding the second next two layers. You can see how the material is literally, it's all pre-wet out in advance. Literally now it's just a case of laminating it, forming the mat now to the shape. Again, the bristle rollers are just fabulous for this type of job. The bristles tend to work themselves into all the little irregularities in the gel coat and plus force the air out and allow the air to come out of the mat. Now this is two layers of ounce and a half mat is what you're seeing being applied. It's been pre-wet out on a wet out board which gets it saturated. There are certain limitations and sizes to this. I would say going over pieces that are about 16 to 18 inches square is about the maximum that you can pick up before the mat will start to become too big and too heavy to, to use like this. Another important point to mention is time. Try not to let your mat sit around too long. Anywhere from four to five minutes is probably 
the maximum length you can let it sit there. Otherwise, the binder breaks down and the mat, you won't be able to pick it up as a system. It'll sort of just flow out of your hands in a big heat in waste of material. After you've molded your fiberglass part, we start one of the trickier parts of the whole operation that has probably ruined more parts in my days than I've ever seen. I'd like to tell you about the tools not to use. And tools not to use are screwdrivers. Bernie's got a pair of them here. They may be the handiest thing that you've got close at hand that looks like they'll do the job, but believe me, you've probably got a 90% chance you're going to nick either the mold or nick the part or poke a hole in something. Believe me, in 30 years of experience, I've seen it happen over and over again. One of the other tools you should never use for assisting your mold is a metal hammer. These may be great on the construction site, but for loosening up a fiberglass mold, they're not. That's an absolute no-no. So please, if you use one, you hit a mold hard enough or apart, you'll start crack it, and you'll end up with another problem for repair. Always use the right tools. Bernie's now going to loosen up the edges on the mold here and show you. You need to go around and get all the edges loose so that the part can come off. Sometimes you actually have the the part ready for release, but it hasn't freed itself up on the edge of the mold. This, in turn, will certainly cause you problems in getting the part off, or will hang the part up. Now what Bernie's going to do is use a plastic hammer and gently tap the part. What this does is basically just springs the part a little bit, um, hopefully breaking the surface. Now the next stage of the operation is Bernie's going to use a plastic wedge and we're going to slide that in. You want to into the edge there. And there it is, released. You heard that gentle cracking sound. You've just witnessed a fiberglass part. You can see it's come off damage free. There's no marks or anything. I'm going to zoom in on that right where Bernie's holding it here. And you can see for yourself that everything looks nice and clean. There's no score marks or anything like that. What I'd like to point out too is, if you could hold up a couple of the other plastic wedges, Bernie. These are the sizes of wedges. You can purchase these on our web store or order them directly from us. They're the best tools on the market for releasing fiberglass parts. In this product here, we've positioned the mat on the mold and we've got the resin in the center of the product. What we're laying up is a little industrial product here, which is about two layers of one ounce mat. And we put no resin against the mold to start with. Because of the complications of the, the number of slits in the, in the mat, we uh, tend to do it this way. This is called dry laminating, where you have to force the resin in only one direction through the mat. You can see how the resin's starting to soak into the mat. changing color. We're now about four or five minutes into the laminate here and the binder in the, the mat has had a chance to break down and we're working the air bubbles out here. In the final touch-up, Bernie's going to run over the laminate here with a bristle roller. Again, these are great. They'll form themselves actually to the surface of this uh, concave edge. You can see the resin coming to the surface there. That's what you're looking for, is that nice little gloss, little drops of resin. Bernie's going to finish this job up, and later on we'll show you the part coming out of the mold. A few gentle taps with a soft hammer helps to start the initial release. The edges are broken free from the mold. Plastic wedges are inserted evenly around the shell's perimeter. Finally, that wonderful sound, a part releasing free. Rayplex helps our customers achieve higher levels of success through technical knowledge and quality materials. Thank you for your interest in our video.